right, welcome in everyone. We're so thrilled that you're spending an hour of your day with us. I'm going to leave this just a moment and, and have people file in and join us. We're super excited for our session this week. Um, if you have been anywhere near the agriculture investment space in the last three or four years, you will have known that regenerative ag, climate conscious ag, um, is front of mind for all investors in the space. And we are super excited to have three superstars here from SIBO Technologies to walk us through how they are changing the way that farmers can address these issues and farm more sustainably. And that's better for obviously the earth as well as the investors who are focused on the space. So we've got three executives from SIBO with us today. I've been wanting these guys on our panels and sessions for a long time, so I am super excited to have everyone with us. Um, I'm, I'm concerned if we lost Dan, hopefully he's going to pop back on. Um, Dan Ryan is the, the president and CEO of SIBO. Uh, welcome, Dan. Uh, we've got Jeanette Ashtakar, who's the vice president of sustainability and regeneration, and Bruno Basso, who's the co-founder of the company, as well as the chief scientist. So they're going to walk you through a presentation and some demonstration, and then I'll pop back in at the end, as I usually do, uh, to facilitate a Q&A. So if you have questions throughout the presentation, please put them in the Q&A chat box, and I'll address as many as I can at the end. Uh, Dan, with that, I will let you take it away. Welcome, and thanks for being here. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to get the presentation up here. Are we seeing a presentation? Yes. Yeah, great, thank you. Well, thanks for joining us today. We're gonna to provide a little bit of a preview of some capabilities that will be coming available next week. So you're gonna be the first people to see uh, some of the demonstration that we're gonna to share today and we're quite excited about it. We have um, a uh, quick origin story on, on SIBO, for those of you who don't know, we were founded by Flagship Pioneering in 2015, and Dr. Bruno Basso, who's on, on, the, on the call with us here today, really with the intention to um, leverage advanced technologies and science to develop really a deep understanding of land and agriculture in, in an effort to try and optimize land use uh, in, in many different ways and provide tools for others and, and marketplaces to really optimize the use of land uh, at scale. So that's kind of where we came from. We've been at this for a few years. Um, I've spent most of the time to this point really developing core technologies and um, now we're delivering products. And so we're excited to share some of that with you today. So I think everybody on the call knows that sustainable practices and regenerative practices are definitely aligned in the long term, both economically and environmentally. Uh, while you're doing environmental good, ultimately you're improving productivity and land valuation and um, you know, potentially reducing input costs, but this takes time and driving acceleration of new practices really is a journey. And we think that it's a journey that you know, we have to do over a period of time that really supports the farmer's needs in this and really provides reasonable incentives for them to either change or maintain the, uh, these kind of practices and behaviors. So that's really what we're focused on today. We're launching a product next week, which is not yet announced called uh, This is a new platform that really is focused on accelerating sustainable practices, really across three kind of pillars, let's say. One is really to be able to understand land, to find, evaluate, and understand land from a lot of different perspectives we'll share with you. Another is really to generate and uh, monetize carbon credits for regenerative practices. And, and that's what we'll show you today. And a third is really to create a marketplace for related products and services. These would be lenders and other, uh, you know, egg input companies that really want to have tailored offerings that support uh, sustainable and regenerative practices. So what we do today, we launched in um, April, the first product really is provide unprecedented visibility into egg land at scale across the nation, right down to a parcel or field level. These are things like the field history, um, valuation estimates, projected yields, uh, productivity, stability of that land, and, and public information like soil and elevation properties, um, really in a 
consumable application that looks like a, you know, a modern consumer facing application. This is where we began and where we've evolved to uh, as an extension today is really to focus on unlocking the carbon markets in agriculture. This is an area that we think the proper way to do this is to be able to do it in a scalable approach that again supports the farmer's needs. And that's what we'll show you today. Um, we look at every field in the country and we can um, calculate at scale the carbon potential or the carbon credit potential for that field based on our simulation and our computer vision and our inferred management practices for that specific area. We have a, uh, as you'll see today, I think a very intuitive platform and marketplace both. This is an information platform combined with a marketplace uh, to buy and sell credits as well as other products and services. And we do this at scale. Um, our focus in the carbon markets is primarily the, the, you know, the corn belt, the corn and soy. We cover corn, soy, cotton, and wheat. Um, uh, and so we have fairly uh, deep coverage and rich coverage across those crops. And we have coverage everywhere. Um, it tends to be richer sets of information in those four crops. And how we do this is really the foundation of the company was to take the ecosystem simulation capabilities, um, develop computer vision and remote sensing capabilities and a lot of data science to take in somewhere uh, plus a, a petabyte or more of large data inputs, weather, soil, satellite imagery, um, elevation, infrastructure data, parcel, tax data, et cetera, manage that data and normalize it and then run it through our processes um, to really generate insights, uh, usable insights like the ones we just mentioned. Those insights then go to the platform uh, and become part of our application. And these run on a routine basis. We're constantly ingesting updated data sets and constant, you know, like weather, for example, and constantly updating uh, the output data. So it's a very data, big data intensive um, uh, platform. And the other thing that we do that's unique is in addition to providing a scaled view of the data, across the country. Um, we also have a micro view of the data uh, in, in the sense that we can come into a specific parcel or a field that's been uploaded and run simulators against that, that parcel or field. And today we do uh, yield simulators and we do carbon credit simulators. And so while we'll come in with an estimated uh, what we call regenerative potential of that parcel, somebody can actually in very quickly input actual management practices or what if management practices and generate what the, uh, what the um, carbon credit would be under those practices. And we'll demonstrate that for you today as well. Uh, Jeanette, you wanna jump in and uh, begin here? Yeah, absolutely. Hi, so what we're gonna show today is a little different than what we have kind of deployed on the market. If you go to SIBOtechnologies.com and check out the product, this is kind of gonna be a sneak preview and stand set of our SIBO Impact product. And SIBO Impact adds an additional layer to our existing capabilities to help farmers monetize the carbon sequestration of their farmland. It also helps anybody interested in farmland. So owners or operators, investors, lenders understand uh, the carbon sequestration and potential uh, economic returns of that sequestration of a piece of farmland. So, you know, as we all know, there is this significant opportunity that seems to exist around monetizing farmland carbon. Um, and because we're able to run these models and have a deep understanding of the land at scale, SIBO is really positioned to, to leverage these capabilities to build a really efficient market for this carbon. So there's rapidly growing demand among corporations for carbon neutral status. Um, what we found is that the current farmers, for current farm-based carbon markets don't particularly scale. So we don't see farmers getting significant returns on their carbon at this moment in time. Um, there tends to be a number of third parties in the system. And you know, to this point, 
in time, we really haven't seen significant scaling of practices, uh, regenerative practices, things like cover cropping. And we're hoping that by kind of democratizing access to farm-based carbon will enable farmers to really, you know, take advantage of this great opportunity um, being driven by carbon neutrality um, to monetize the carbon sequestration potential of their farm to not only promote long-term resiliency uh, and pro you know long-term resiliency and profitability in their own farms, but to provide a, a benefit to the environment as well. And Dan, if you can go to the next slide, I'll talk a little bit about kind of what SIBO carbon is, a life cycle of a SIBO carbon credit. So you know what we found is that. Um, Farming, you know, farming operates on an annual cycle. Farming decisions are made annually. So some years you can't do the practices you intended to because of the weather, or you have to modify your approach because of the markets and, and annual conditions. And so SIBO's framing our credit as part of this cycle, an annual cycle. So the idea is that the farmer can come onto the platform, and we'll show you this really shortly, um, and they can actually see what we're calling regenerative potential. So they can see the potential of a field to sequester carbon under regenerative practices. So before having to do anything or pick up a phone or put a number into a piece of software, a grower can know how many carbon credits could be generated and sold from a specific field before they ever go and operate on it. So once the farmer comes in and sees this potential, they can actually enroll their own farms in our program. So they can say, you know, here's my field boundaries. I'd like to enroll and monetize my carbon. Um, and SIBO will actually allow them to very simply input their practices. So because of that great um, data system that Dan explained, where we're able to take in all of this information at scale and process it, we're also able to pre kind of compute a lot of the information that we would need from a farmer to calculate their carbon credits. So we only need a little bit of information and we're able to calculate the actual number of tons of carbon sequestration that occur on an annual basis on a field because of a farmer's choice to adopt expensive regenerative practices. We're then able to list these credits as coming soon and throughout the growing season, we monitor those farm fields enrolled in our program to verify that the practices are taking place. So we're able to see that the farmer plants the cover crop in the fall. We see the cover crop emerge using remote sensing and computer vision. We watch the cover crop throughout the season. And then we're able to see that the farmer plants their primary cash crop into the cover crop and that cash crop emerge. And we're able to verify that the practices in the sequestration took place. And we then list the credit for sale on the platform and then go ahead and sell the credit. So it doesn't take years and years for a farmer to seek returns on the carbon. It's an annual basis because farming decisions are made annually. So I think from here, it's probably a good time for me to go ahead and jump into the platform. Jeanette, one thing I, just to add, I think that the, as you're setting up the platform, this is at no cost to the farmers and enrollees um, and the farmer retains ownership of these credits. We're, we're providing a tooling, a tool set that does a quantification verification in a marketplace, but uh, the farmers control the credits and there's no charge to them in, uh, in using the service. Absolutely. And Dan, I think you have to stop sharing and then I can go okay. ahead and pick it up. All there right. Yeah. And this is really, you know, the first opportunity for farmers to directly sell their carbon to buyers, as Dan mentioned. So, you know, it's we're trying to create a very efficient and scaled marketplace where, you know, there's there's as as little barriers in between the grower and the carbon buyer as possible. And again, the, the motivation behind that is so that we can get as much money as possible back to the farmer because they are the ones at their own cost, at their own risk, who are adopting these practices on an annual basis. So this is the SIBO platform that we're going to come out with in just a little bit over a week. Um, it's slightly different than the one you see today if you go to our website. So something we notice immediately um, is there's a big map. So what we focus on at SIBO is scale. Um, all of the data that we generate is generated all the way down on an individual field level, but we're able to take that information and scale it up all the way to a big region. So what this you're seeing here in this map, the colors are the number of search results or number of parcels we have data for in each uh, county. And as we scroll over the map, we can see this summarized at a county level. And down here, we see that we have almost 4 million search results. So there's close to 4 million parcels available to explore with incredibly rich data on this platform. 
We also offer a number of data layers. So an example would be our productivity score. So our productivity score is calculated in-house. This is a proprietary measure of field productivity that applies across the United States, across the Corn Belt region. So you're able to compare the productivity of a field in Iowa with the productivity of a field in Nebraska. And again, this is computed at the local level, at the field level, and scaled all the way up. So we could scroll all the way down into the map and see this as well. We also look at things like valuation. So again, we're trying to provide owners and operators who are scaling their operations leasing and buying land, as well as investors and lenders, insights into pieces of land that they've never operated on themselves. So we're able to give information about things like productivity, again, the valuation, how much do we think it's worth? This would be something kind of like a Zestimate that you would get on Zillow. Uh, and we also come up with lease values because we see there's a lot of compression in lease prices. And a lot of that could be due to lack of transparent information about the inherent productivity of a piece of land. And we're trying to bring that to light. So a typical kind of user of SIBO might be, again, an owner operator, someone who's looking to expand their operation, their leasing land. You know, they may also be very interested in enrolling their land in carbon programs or adopting regenerative practices. And this is something that's new and kind of buzzworthy, but no farmers, you know, very few farmers have actually had direct access to these markets. So when a grower comes into our new SIBO platform, they're immediately able to see on the map these pins. And when we scroll over the pins, they actually list carbon credits for sale. So as a grower coming into this platform, I see right away that my neighbors are actually able to monetize their carbon and it's listed right here for the public to see. I also see on the left hand side of the screen some advertisements and this is the section of the application where we're going to be promoting uh, companies, organizations, articles, you know, interesting maps and tidbits of data, uh, that relate to regenerative and sustainable agriculture. So anyone can come on and use the SIBO platform, but we're really trying to focus on promoting the adoption of regenerative ag. So we would love you know, to have advertisements from various um, you know, uh, lenders who are interested in potentially financing the transition to regenerative or organic ag. Um, we like to have, you know, listing agents for you know various agricultural parcels and something else that we advertise on here is our own carbon program so we're able to invite farmers to come onto the platform um, and enroll their fields in our carbon programs we also list our carbon credits for sale here on the left hand side as well and we can show off all different types of map layers you know here's a link to some really you know interesting map layers we can advertise as well so as a grower, I come on and now I see all these great opportunities. Maybe I see some ads for cover cropping in my area at a discount um, and I start to get kind of more interested and excited about sustainable practices. And now I want to kind of know what's going on down at these fields here where I see these pins. You know, are my neighbors really getting money for their carbon? And is this something I can also do as well? And the way that SIBO kind of addresses this, you know, as I mentioned earlier, was through regenerative potential. So this is kind of a sneak peek of a layer that we're gonna have available for the full Corn Belt at launch, where we have gone ahead and calculated regenerative potential or the ability of a field to sequester carbon um, under regenerative management. We have calculated this for every farm field in the Midwest. So we're able to generate kind of this broad layer and identify areas where there would be bigger impact, bigger return on the investment of practices like cover cropping and minimal tillage, because we know that some environments and some soil types are more conducive to the accumulation of carbon than others. And at SIBO, we're able to tell you that in advance before you ever put a cover crop in the ground. So again, I'm a grower. I see this interesting regenerative potential score. I see these cool pins in the map. I want to know what's going on. So we can go ahead and zoom all the way out from the national level, all the way down to the individual individual farm field level. So keep scrolling in.
And as we get down to the level of the farm field, we now see these regenerative potential scores pop up for every field. So here we have listed out in tons per acre, the amount of carbon that could be sequestered under regenerative practices over the course of a growing season. Um, and we see, you know, some fields have higher scores than other, and this would indicate that these fields would be able to sequester more carbon for the same practices than others. So you get a little bit more bang for your buck. Um, so again, I'm really interested in what's going on down here. So I click into one of these fields to check out regenerative potential. Um, we have enormous amounts of data um, on each of these farm fields, not just related to sustainability, but I'm gonna start by focusing on the new stuff that we're gonna be deploying. And so, what we have here is a calculation of the carbon footprint of this field under conventional management, as well as under regenerative management. So conventional management would be things like, you know, no rotations, no cover cropping. We would use uh, conventional tillage and a standard nitrogen application. And we come up with regionally specific uh, descriptions of conventional practices. So we have a very good idea of what type of hybrids are planted, how much nitrogen is applied, uh, you know, what type of tillage is used kind of on a regional basis. So that's our baseline, our conventional practices. And we calculate the carbon footprint looking at N2O emissions. These are all converted into carbon equivalents, which is the way that carbon is bought and sold. But we're looking at N2O emissions from soil. We're looking at, you know, carbon emissions due to diesel uses and fertilizer production. And then we're also looking at the carbon released or gained from the soil because of the adoption of these different practices. So for for our you know, emissions that we're looking at, N2O, diesel, and fertilizer, we use IPCC equations, you know, very well standardized, accepted uh, equations to calculate that. And for soil carbon release, we use a very exciting biogeophysical model that comes out of Michigan State and Dr. Bruno Basso, who's with us today, called SALIS. And this model is very well tested in academia. Bruno actually recently won a paper of the year award for a great soil carbon paper. So we're really proud to have this technology as part of SIBO and something we've been able to scale and make work efficiently and immediately on every piece of farmland. So we've gone ahead and we've calculated the carbon footprint again under conventional management, and then we've calculated it under regenerative management. So we've kind of set a standard, you know, level of regenerative management. So we're talking about a, you know, corn soy rotation, cover crop, no-till, and a little bit reduced nitrogen. And we're able to calculate the carbon footprint under those conditions, compare it with the conventional practices, and the difference between those numbers is our regenerative potential. If you were to implement the practice practices listed here, uh, corn soy rotation, cover crop, no-till, and reduced nitrogen, uh, very slightly reduced nitrogen, about 5%, you would sequester or you would reduce your emissions and sequester up to 232.3 tons of CO2 for this 161 acre farm field. So that's really exciting. And what SIBO is going to bring to market is the ability for a farmer to say, this is my field and I want to claim that regenerative potential and enroll in SIBO's carbon program. Now, as a grower, though, I don't think, you know, I, I could adopt all of these practices. You know, I may be interested, you know, in no-till, I, you know, I, but I'm not sure I want to do it, or, you know, maybe I, I did a different rotation, etc. So I want to be able to put in my own practices. So as a grower, I can then come in and see what would happen under my form of management. So let's kind of change this up and say we did soy last year, corn this year, uh, we did cover crops, maybe it was a legume and we had a soy rotation, so we didn't fertilize. Um, and then we're able to kind of go in, change our practices, hit calculate, and come up with a new carbon footprint. And so the farmer is able to then identify what the carbon footprint would be under a different type of practice, um, and then kind of change and assess their regenerative potential. And again, we're able to make this work on any field. So I can click in kind of any field I want to. It'll bring up you know, this scorecard, we can assess the regenerative potential, we can change the management practices to whatever we want, we can hit calculate and come up with a new value. So this is awesome. You know, I, I see this new capability on the platform as a grower. Um, I see there's this idea of regenerative potential. 
But I still want to get back to my neighbors who I think are actually realizing that potential and selling their carbon. And that's these fields that you see here in red. So these are actual growers who are enrolled in our 2020 pilot program. Um, we have quantified the greenhouse gas emissions that occurred over the 2020 growing season. So that was a cover crop planted in the fall of 2019, um, uh, a you know, a, emerged in early 2020, and a cash crop was planted in, in uh, spring 2020 and just harvested now. So these are kind of the freshest credits we have. This is the sequestration that just occurred. All of the practices have been verified using our platform. So we know they did what they said they did. This stuff happened. Um, and we're listing it for sale as soon as we bring this to market. So kind of clicking into one of these, you know, th now we see instead of that regenerative potential card, we have a credit report. So what this is showing is the number of carbon credits that are actually available from this field that have been generated and are for sale. And we'll, uh, it, you know, we'll enable people to come in and actually go ahead and buy credits directly from the farm field eventually or from a pool of credits if they prefer. Again, the grower owns the credits. SIBO doesn't own them, um, but SIBO is able to broker uh, and negotiate on the behalf of the grower as well if we'd like to make large business to business carbon transactions. So those companies looking to meet their neutrality goal. But it is important to us to offer individuals themselves access to this platform to buy directly to farmers as well, because it's also a great promotional tool for growers. They get to come into the platform and see that people can actually buy directly from them. So I'm a grower, I come in, I see my buddies are actually getting carbon credits. I see there's a potential for me to figure out my regenerative potential anywhere. And I wanna know how does this apply to my land and my decisions? So we also have some kind of nascent portfolio capabilities where we can build portfolios and manage our land within the SIBO platform. And so this is uh, taking us towards a place I used to live, West Lafayette, Indiana, uh, where I was at Purdue University. Um, and I just kind of checked out some fields there. So maybe let's say I'm a grower and these are some fields I've been operating on. And one of them I actually was gonna plant winter wheat on. And I'm wondering, can I get credits for it? So I'm able to go directly into my portfolio land that I've been operating on and immediately identify the regenerative potential. And we'll give growers the ability right here to say, I wanna enroll, put their hand up and get directly into our system to start selling their carbon. So this is great. I'm gonna enroll in SIBO's program. But what I really came on the platform today for was a grower, as a grower was to scout for land. So, you know, besides my land, there are a few of these parcels that I've been looking at and thinking of either buying no, or renting, and I want to make the decision, um, but now I have a new signal, I have new information, and I'm able to see that some of these parcels actually have a regenerative potential themselves. And this one's pretty huge. So again, I can come in, I can change my practices, I can calculate the regenerative potential. And now I know that if I operate on this field, I can expect you know, a return of close to 400 credits, which could sell you know, around $15, $20 a credit. That's a significant signal, a great piece of information to have before I go ahead and make the decision to operate on this piece of land. You know, there's significantly more information that I need to op operate on a piece of land as well. And so SIBO still provides a lot of this great information beyond just carbon. So what we're also able to do is provide information on things like the valuation. So we estimate that this parcel is worth around $2 million and it would lease for $266 an acre. Um, we have taken a guess at the productivity. We've also able to do some yield simulation on this piece of ground. So we're if we're in the current growing season, we could actually predict what it's going to yield this year. Um, we take a look at its stability and its historical performance. So I'm going to dive just a, a little quickly into these. So taking a look at valuation, and this is data that's available through the platform today if you log on. Um, we see that this parcel is a little bit more valuable than the average for the county. So again, we're trying to layer on all the information that an investor would need to make a really wise decision about a piece of land without going there in person and interrogating the entire community about that parcel's history. So we have an idea of the valuation and how it compares. We have information on tax assessment. We know who the owners are. 
we're also able to perform, as I said, yield simulations. So, and the season is over now, but during the growing season, we're actually able to tell you how this farm we think would compare to the 10 year historical average of that field itself. So is it, per, is it performing better or worse than average? We're also able to compare it to the rest of the county to show you how it compares to the land around it. We even project things like maturity date. So the season's over now, we don't have a, rate, a, a range. We had projected that this reached maturity on 915. And then we're actually able to run our simulations in real time. So we can change the information and we can see how it affects the outcome. So growers can put their actual scenario in. And as the growing season progresses, our predictions get better and better and better. We also give really cool information about the weather data throughout the growing season. We also give information about history. So this is another thing when you are, you know, operating on a piece of ground for the first time or you're going to invest in it, you don't know what has happened on it unless you're able to one dig through all of the government satellite data which can be very difficult and cumbersome to access if you're not a professional used to doing that. Um, or you can, you know, talk to the people who used to operate on it. And if you don't have that access, you know, to those individuals who have worked that land, um, there's really no way to know what you're getting at without, you know, spending a lot of money on agronomists and sampling, et cetera. So what SIBO does is uses remote sensing and computer vision to look backwards in time and see how the land was managed. So we're able to identify what the cropping practices were, you know, was it corn, soy, et cetera. Um, and then we're able to use a uh, modeling, um, mechanistic crop growth modeling to be able to figure out what we think the land could have yielded. So we're able to tell you not only what was grown on it, but how much was grown. And again, this is without having to get data directly from a grower. We also, again, provide, you know, weather data, etc. Something else that we generate using remote sensing is a stability map. And this is a great piece of technology that we've uh, worked with uh, Bruto from Michigan State to kind of adopt and scale. Um, so what you see here are, is a parcel divided into different zones based on their performance. So we look back over years of satellite imagery and identify areas that routinely perform the same. So the dark green areas perform well relative to that field year after year. The lighter green areas are average and the yellower areas are the lower performing areas of that field. But you can expect these areas to perform similarly year after year. The red areas are unstable variable locations. So these could be things like depression, where in depressions where in a wet year, the plants will drown, but in a dry year, they flourish. You know, this could also be a sandy hilltop where, you know, some years it, it performs okay and some years it doesn't perform at all. You know, these are highly variable locations and it's very important to understand that this variability exists in a field before you go in and operate on it. But this type of zone based map is typically never available without either having operated on it and collected combine data or without hiring an agronomist who's going to come in and do a lot of sampling and build you a detailed map. So this is on day one, you're going to be able to understand, do I need to do intensive precision management on this field or is it going to be a straightforward operation? So that's the stability map. We also provide information about productivity. So we've run our models everywhere and simulated how much we think can grow on them. And we use that to come up with these productivity scores. Um, and then again, we're also showing information about sustainability. Um, this is from our old platform where we talk about greenhouse gas emissions, but kind of in today's version, we're framing everything through this lens of SIBO impact. All right. And so kind of coming back to the main platform here, again, we are showing what we're calling regenerative potential. So this is the, the land's ability to sequester carbon and generate carbon credits at the field level all the way out to the national level. And as soon as we bring this to market, we will also offer farmers the ability to enroll in our program, quantify their carbon and bring it to, you know, to the market kind of immediately. And I can kind of take a, take a step back here. And Dan, you could jump in if there were any kind of last minute comments you wanted to make before we leave the demo and kind of take it over to Bruno for a few questions. 
No, I think uh, let's let's see what kind of questions people have. All right. So really quickly, I would like to introduce uh, Dr. Bruno Basso. He is a co-founder of SIBO and chief scientist, and uh, he's a great member of our team who, who brings a lot of support and mentorship to, to our scientists at SIBO. So Bruno, I just kind of wanted to ask you a couple questions. Um, you know, one specifically about SIBO's approach to generating carbon credits, looking at things kind of on an annual basis and using models. And just as, a, as an academic professor who is always at the leading edge in this space, we'd love to hear your opinion on this approach. Thank you very much, uh, Jeanette. And uh, I also would like to thank the Global Leg Investment um, for organizing this webinar. It's, it's a great opportunity for us to share uh, the, the really um, heavy and solid work we've been doing over the years. So I, I think your uh, uh, question is, is extremely valid, but I want to take a step back just to make sure people understand that we are dealing with very complex uh, systems, not just from a, a natural system in terms of you know, biophysical or biogeochemical point of view, but also because the decisions that a farmer has to make, they deal with economics. And so a, they always deal with a trade-off. And, and so the possibility of capturing these feedbacks between the soil, the climate management and genetics can only be accounted through a, a, a system approach as we have uh, developed here. And not just a simple sort of system approach, but rather geospatial system approach where both space and time are, uh, are accounted. And so the decision that a farmer makes are, um, they're basically bombarded by uh, people operating in the space and often um, offering technologies that may not be necessarily what they look for. And so there is this level of complexity that the technology has to pay off uh, for farmer. So the system um, that um, we, the Jeanette, you did a fantastic job and as well as uh, Dan in illustrating uh, what we do. I would say that uh, straight to answer your question about timing and um, I also answer some of the questions uh, that uh, came in the Q and A and one was obviously, they're all very important, but one was, uh, spot on in terms of saying how uh, you uh, verify these sorts of uh, you know claims and credits and uh, how um, uh, what about the long term uh, uh, possibility of sequestering carbon and um, so the the annual basis is is a critical piece because as you understand by doing things on an annual basis we're dealing with a very short time uh, frame in agriculture which obviously wouldn't be the time frame that people would associate with sequestering um, a large amount of carbon because it takes time. You accumulate carbon in the soil by doing two things. Either you put carbon in the soil or you avoid emitting carbon. And so on a short-term basis, on a yearly basis, a farmer could basically only show that she is not emitting uh, these sorts of things. And so one thing that you coming from me, you know, may be biased, but Salus has a very strong uh, background in terms of application and uh, validation because has these, these unique features of being a very detailed crop model. Salus evolves from the well-known Ceres model, it was developed by Joe Ricci uh, several years ago. And it was actually a result of a strategic investment of the US government, uh, the, the central intelligence to be able to predict how much wheat was produced in Russia during the Cold War. Salus is something that I've developed in, in continuing the work that Joe had, uh, had done in linking a biogeochemical model so to be able to quantify the impact of management. Things have changed since you know, the 70s and new genetics. And so Salus accounts for genetically modified sorts of cultivars, the new, the latest cultivars, and which in, unfortunately many other model, uh, highly respected models may not capture all these features related to, uh, to management. And, and so 
the, uh, the possibility of linking a very detailed crop model with a biogeochemical model and the knowledge of understanding risk related to spatial and temporal variability with the stability work that I've developed with you guys is um, it's a unique, um, obviously, kind of system. And the quantification on a yearly basis is verified by the fact that we know pretty well the behavior of a cover crop that grows in three months, how much carbon is being returned. In addition, we also know how much CO2 is not emitted by doing no tillage versus conventional tillage. So it's a combination of be able to get the, the management data that the farmers would provide if they were to join the CBO, in addition to a completely independent way of how we establish through this agronomo automated AI system that we captured uh, this feedback. As you know, I can talk a long time on this, so I wanna make sure that the annual basis is a critical step for the farmer to be able to realize that they can do a lot in terms of carbon sequestration, but in the sense of CO2 uh, equivalent that is not emitted. The sequestration is going to be obviously extremely low or almost none in a yearly basis, but it's, it's a way of them realizing that it, carbon is a commodity and they can basically adopt these regenerative practices. They have a benefit uh, on a longer term. They improve soil organic matter, they improve uh, aggregate stability, they hold more water because the aggregates keep water inside. The carbon is kept in the aggregates and so it's not broken out and made available for microbial decompositions. And so all these mechanisms are pretty well understood. And so just to conclude, the feature that, that um, you have seen today of, uh, of uh, SIBO are really unique about this feedback that unless you use a geospatial scalable system approach, it's just nearly impossible to be able to quantify the fate of the regenerative practices. And farmers could not embark into additional cost in the dark to be able to know what, what, what are my chances of doing something in a positive way. Do you sequest different amount or you emit less whether you have a sandy soil or a clay soil? It means different thing if you have, you know, 1.2% of organic carbon, it depends. I mean, it, it really it has to be contextualized. And again, the input that go into the salus and the dynamic aspect of this component we really move this system forward where farmers are at the center of uh, the, the, uh, the decision making and they get rewarded again by not emitting because as you know, agriculture is responsible for greenhouse gas emissions through the emissions, not necessarily through the lack of fertilization. So agriculture is truly a solution rather than a problem to the climate crisis. And, and you have to understand short-term versus long-term dynamics. So thank you, Bruno. That's great. Um, you really, you know, you bring up a really great point around this idea of addition uh, of uh, reduction of emissions. So, you know, it's not just about agricultural land being able to suck carbon out of the atmosphere and forever store it underneath the ground, because we know that that's not viable when it comes to the way agriculture actually functions. Weather changes every year. Uh, markets change every year, economics change every year. So farmers have to choose to adopt these practices on an annual basis, which is why we're trying to incent them annually. Um, something I think you know, might be interesting to talk a little about then is this idea of scale. And you know, we see some questions coming up um, in, the, in the chat. We can get to some of those as well, but talking specifically about you know, um, really detailed level of ground truthing and, and, and um, sampling and et cetera. So I wanted to talk a little bit about the concept of scale and how this approach, you know, might be more conducive to that. Yes. So, I mean, scale lays the, the foundation of understanding whether it's um, valuable for, for a farmer to be able to decide whether they, they go on a particular practices. And, and the reason you need to tackle this problem at scale, because Anything that with experiments or potential, you know, sampling, it's only valid for the particular location. It won't necessarily mean something else um, 
you know, the same results for another. And so if we really want to take regenerative practices as scale, that needs to be accounted on each single field as we do. We don't project based on a, a, a known level of information that we know. We do not use AI to project. We generate this knowledge based on, you know, the simulation system and the, the remotely sense, dynamic remotely sense. We collaborate with, you know, partners that deliver images and we have a possibility of understanding the dynamics and not for one field for uh, the rest of the field. And so I think you, you, you hit the, the nail in the head by saying, you know, that the agriculture is very dynamic. There is change in decision. There was a question about what a farmer could change and decide to go and till, obviously. But the person that adopts a regenerative practices start basically goes into a virtuous cycle and basically gets out of a, a, the vicious cycle of be able to, you know, basically seeing the carbon degrading, going lower, redo the, the, the yields go low and the, the amount of residues that they get returned to the soil versus the opposite side where you start seeing benefits from a biophysical point of view, again, of accumulating soil organic matter and benefits. And so the short term and long term have to be accounted together. And again, the possibility of scaling, I, I, will, I saw questions about different crops. And so imagine the possibility of using a system that relies just on input on crops that they may be less monitored. And so the possibility of modeling the system allows to bring these very valuable practices at scale to, to make agriculture mass more, you know, more massive. And, I want to answer a question about the low prices. And if you think that obviously this will change as much as, but even if we stay with the current practices, a, a reduction on emissions, as you have seen, could range in pretty large amount of CO2 emitted um, that is basically not emitted by no, doing no tillage. And the sizes of these farms are large. They're large enough to be able to generate thousands of, of dollars that they don't necessarily basically cost, they cost the implementation of the management, but many farmers are already deciding to move in this direction. So another thing on a little bit parallel side, my research continues to go in the direction of helping farmer realize how many parts of the fields or some fields are basically not necessarily gifted for some level of production and should be allocated to alternative crops. And SIBO accounts for that by being able to see if you were to go into different practices and you don't till the soil and you go in, let's say into more of a, a pollinator or you know, areas within the fields that are not um, being productive at the moment. So those sequestration is, is basically they're quantified. And, and so there's quite a bit of economics. We've done the math of how much can really bring into a farm by realizing that carbon is a commodity that can really start, you know, using to, to basically enter this uh, virtuous cycle. Awesome. Thank you, Bruno. That's great. And I think this might be a good time to maybe take it a few questions from the audience. Yeah, like I said, I've answered while you were talking uh, as many as I could. Uh, uh, what is yes, Dr. Dr. Basso, thank you. You gave us a great assist there at the beginning. This is actually one of the more robust uh, Q&A chats I've, I've seen doing these. So there are lots and lots of questions. Yeah, um, I can go quick uh, to some. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, I'd love, I'd love to pose a couple um, and try to sort of condense some um, that are having the same vibe. So the last one that came in is actually the first one that I had wanted to ask as we were going through the presentation. And that is just from a macro perspective, like who is buying carbon credits? Why are they doing that? You know, what is the basis for the whole ball game for carbon markets? Who's buying these? Yeah, I can so, take that. Oh, go ahead. Yeah, please. No, I yeah. just want to say that I, I used, unfortunately for work and for uh, several other reasons, I used to fly a lot and, and the airlines would offer a possibility to offset your carbon emission. So you could pay fly Delta, you pay $10 to basically plant a certain number of trees. So this is a concept that actually then really pushes to be able to start doing even for single individuals, to be able to feel 
the value of offsetting the emissions. Everybody, we emit more. We there are many calculators, and we you know you can quantify how much is emitted. But large companies, the food system is responsible for about 35 percent of the greenhouse gas emissions, and everybody's looking a way of doing it better inside the production of the food system. But the solution is be able to do better beforehand and be able to offset this emission. So large companies without naming, but you, you, you can only imagine who they are, um, have a very strong interest and they have a strong sustainability division in trying to do this. So we're, all, we're really at the beginning because it's the first time that sold carbon in the last few years and it's coming still in the infancy where sold carbon is going to be an equivalent market as the forestry. And I can talk about the, some of the parallelism between the forest market and, and the soil carbon market, uh, but I'd like to have Jeanette continue. If you, yeah, and I, and I think you're dead on, Bruno. It's big corporations, and I think we can name them. We see companies like Microsoft coming out and making carbon, carbon neutral pledges. You know, there's companies like Shopify who are being very aggressive about um, embracing land-based and farm-based carbon. There are companies looking for more innovative types of carbon and, you know, looking for the scale that we're bringing. That's a market that really seems like it is poised to take off. You know, it's been signaling for a long time. Um, and now we're actually seeing payments going out to farmers. And I truly believe we're going to reach a point real soon where we are highly supply limited with this farm-based carbon. And this is why SIBO is really taking this scaled approach. And I've seen, um, you know, questions about, you know, verification or, or you know, how you're, um, you know, ground truthing the carbon and the way that you're registering the carbon. SIBO is taking a very differentiated approach to this. Um, we think that in order to scale, we need to make this really easy for farmers to enroll. So making them guarantee that they're going to do the same practice for 10 years is not viable because, you know, that's just not how agricultural functions. If you're leasing a piece of land, you're not going to be on there for 10 years guaranteed. Um, so we're thinking a lot about scale. So instead of going out and applying to join another carbon, carbon registry, SIBO is a credit registry. We are able to quantify, verify, and register credits generated from farmland in an incredibly uh, convenient manner. We're using IPCC standards that are, you know, we don't need to go out and ground truth those because they've been ground truth already. We're using those equations and we're using the SALIS model, which has also had significant amount of academic validation, enormous number of studies that Bruno has done. Um, and we, of course, look field by field and make sure that our results are in line and make sense. And they are in line and make sense. But what we're not doing is going out year after year and taking soil samples on a field to show that carbon is increasing and, and then penalizing the farmer if those samples don't show carbon accumulation year after year. Because one, it doesn't scale. Who has money to time to do that? Farmers aren't going to opt into it. They're already paying 50 bucks an acre to adopt the cover cropping practice when they could maybe get 15 bucks return from the credit. So having them also meet this additional bar of, of sampling isn't viable. You know, another reason behind it is that I'm a soil scientist. You know, I have a PhD in soil sciences my whole life, my whole background. And I know that if I sample today and I accidentally have worm poop in my sample and five years from now I go to the same place and the worm poop isn't there, my carbon went down. And if I'm a grower enrolled in, you know, if I'm a grower and I have to show accumulation of carbon to get a credit, I won't get the credit. And that's a fault of the sampling. You know, if you take one soil sample, put it in three bags and send it to three labs, you get three different answers. And so we're not trying to, you know, make the bar so incredibly high that farmers are turned off from carbon credits and they're turned off from regenerative ag. We want them to see a reliable, um, you know, a, a reliable, easy source of, you know, a little bit of return on this massive risk and investment they're making in regenerative ag. And we want to do that every year. So every single year when they have to make that decision on the fly based on that year's weather and economics, if they're going to plant a cover crop or if they're going to harvest, you know, am I going to go harvest my wheat and bale it for hay or am I going to keep it on the field for cover? We want them to have the best information and access to markets that help them make that decision decision because they know, well, if I don't sell it for weed, I'll actually get a few bucks for it. You know, if I don't bail that, hey, I can actually get something out of it that's good for me, good for my land, good for the environment, good for my bottom line. Great. Thank you, Jeanette. 
Um, there have been a lot of questions about scaling this globally um, in Asia, Australia, Canada. What is the plan for CBO's expansion internationally? Dan, do you want to take that one? Sure. Yeah, I think um, our near-term focus is clearly on the U.S. It's a big, uh, a big lift just to get this kind of scale that we've delivered so far. But we are confident we can bring the same capability internationally, and we plan to do so. Uh, I think as we look forward uh, over the next few months, we're going to be pretty, pretty heavily focused on, on the U.S. Um, land. But we are beginning to look at are there partnerships that we can develop uh, internationally where we can jointly go into different regions and uh, validate these models and begin doing the same things there. So we're interested in, in moving internationally. Obviously, this is not a U.S. problem. It's a global opportunity, I should say, not a problem. Um, and I think we, we're lo looking towards potential partnerships to do that. I added some question about the, the Australia and Canada and India. The benefit of the Salus, there is one version of Salus. The process behaved the same. And let you change soil, you change climate, it, it's captured in that sort of variation. So the model is scalable, as been shown, is it, it's one of the main models of the AgMIP agricultural modeling into comparison with where all these models are applied, like in the IPCC sorts of mode, it's applied globally. And like Dan said, it depends on the type of question. We have done projects in Brazil, Argentina, Malaysia, uh, obviously Europe. I work extensively in Africa and Salus has been used there. So uh, it's more of a strategic decisions and the type of market and uh, problem to be solved. Great, thanks. And I know that, you know, regenerative ag practices are not limited to commodity crops. A lot of people are asking in terms of ranch land or permanence or horticulture, right. what, is, what is the opportunity for these people? That's a great question. And we are, you know, in terms of what SIBO is doing, we are starting, you know, with commodities and it, it starts there. So we're thinking about how do we apply this to pasture land, um, you know, the, et cetera. And so hopefully we'll have some offerings in the future that for, for those folks as well. Um, and then, you know, Bruno, do you have any kind of comments on, on carbon markets and, and possibilities yes. for-, for there is a significant demand um, in uh, orchards uh, because of the products going into food systems. And so uh, Salus has the capacity to simulate some of those systems as well as the inter, uh, the space between rows, the intercropping areas. Um, it has a well-established pasture models for rangeland. And um, so that there will be um, a possibility, it's again, it's a new, a relatively new um, startup and with a very strong focus to deliver. Uh, and, and so if new possibility comes, we'll be ready to basically scale the company to do, to, to, to uh, provide this sort of service across ecosystems. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one thing I wonder, is there, is there a potential, you know, down the road, once this becomes more established practice and once carbon markets become a more familiar territory, is there potentially a labeling scheme for food that's generated off of these properties? We always talked about the SIBO, ver SIBO verified. Um, so there is certainly opportunity and possibility to be able to have a quality measure of the ecosystem services and the environment that um, has basically benefited by producing that sorts of food. Um, that will be, will require a different level of partnership. But again, I'm sure people have taken the message that we're capable of capturing the complexity of the system between the, the inputs of climate, soil, constantly changing management to be able to play the role of scalability in this assessment as much as we know about these processes, then again, I think it's a it's a broader endeavor to be able to get into a quality based and possibility of labeling, especially now with a lot. We actually, this is a good opportunity for me to add the last thought on you know blockchain and the way fertilizer is delivered. We have a new way of basically capturing um, that in a verified form. And so the new technology on verification schemes um, are certainly on, in, on a, a radar and uh, we'll be moving in that direction for sure. Bruno, also, I think it should be said that we can, we can 
we can ingest anybody's portfolio of fields, whether that's a food producer or a consumer company, and look at a portfolio view from a, from a supply chain impact perspective, the product can generate those kind of outputs as well for anybody's portfolio. Uh, it doesn't have to just be us doing it for a farmer's carbon market. And um, we can actually quantify the impact of practices or actually farming different portfolios of land for any enterprise. And as we see other other companies starting to evolve their own carbon neutral labels, this is, you know, this is a direct peak, as Dan said, into the supply chain. So if I as a company want to label my own product as carbon neutral, I first need to know the carbon footprint of my supply chain. SIBO can help with that. And I also need to offset it, which SIBO, you know, can also help with. All right, perfect. Well, that's our time, everyone. There are quite a lot of questions we were not able to get to. I'm going to send Dan, Jeanette, and Bruno a report of all of these questions, and hopefully they'll follow up with some of you individually um, so that uh, you can get those answered. Um, I just, I think about the time when I started doing this over a decade ago, and there were lots of buzzwords around sustainability, but very few ways to measure it. I think we're in a very exciting time and I was just really pleased to have all of you with us today. And I can't wait to see where the company goes from here. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all.